The Depth to Delve Deep by Will Brighton. Chapter 10 Conversations Roke passes time playing darts when he's alone in the bar, even when others are around. He likes darts. He hits those double and triple twenties like he hits the bullseye. And like Poole, he plays better after a few. Not so, a not so after a few too many. In the inn, uh, in the, inn the inn has only one only one person tending a bar, tending bar. He's an aging barman who's a long-time friend of the father of the family run in. There's no possibility for Roke to replace him. That's the job he applies for. All that's available are the dishes, and he does them reluctantly. Behind the bar is where he wants to be. Occasionally, an odd conversation with the barkeep comes up. It starts after Roke's had a few pints intermittently, intermittently spaced between bags of crisps pork rinds, and salted nuts. Crisps is another term he comes to learn, meaning chips. Pork rinds, well, doesn't even want to know. Meanwhile, the two talk about whatever while other staff members and or clientele from the community pipe in and pop out. Rote always draws on what he knows and what he continues to learn to know a kin and kin to all things Scottish to start conversations. He recalls before arriving abroad about hearing and seeing the terrible toll the foot and mouth disease had on Great Britain. He brings it up in topic one time and touches a few nerves. It seems still unsettled. They discuss the possible causes while the barkeep gives his take on the telltale rabbit trail. He decides due to the distribution process, the disease spreads rapidly. Roth supposes no one really knows and probably still don't know how the madness starts, let alone spreads. But when it does, the whole world knows. They end up wiping out entire herds. Rote's seen the poignant pyres pictured on the news with heaps of sheep and cows burning like bale fires. After a few pints and pensive ponderous moments to reflect on the reason therein, Rote offers up his own tipple take on the topic. He tells them about the rabbits. In every pasture, bird along every hedgerow, there are hundreds if not thousands of bunnies bounding and bouncing about, benign to any bane, strip, strip, gulp, gulp. He lights another smoke, and doing so, they leave little poop pellets here and there and everywhere, where the herds hoof and mouths graze and not a blah, and until now he proposes, while well, his head grows heavy from the alcohol and the thoughts therein, that those rabbits and their little poop pellet poo seize that sieve as the source of the foot and mouth stew. He stops and stews over his train of thought. He takes a sip, gulp, back on track. It's because there's no more birds of prey and predators. No wolves wiped out medieval manhunts. Scapegoats for the sheep's survival. Demonized with all sorts of devil. From Little Red Riding Hood to the three little pigs. Sip, sip, gulp, gulp, gulp. Their dwellings dwindled, clearly cut away. And in so all sustainable sustenance swindled, systematically they succumb to the succulent sheep and the shots that keep. Aye, too many damn sheep, thinks Rote, and while the froth wears off, another tipple take takes place while the froth blower and his barkeep fritter with Freemasonry. How and why, who knows, but one thing for sure, a pseudo-spontaneous fellowship begins. Rote senses this fellow wants to show him some secret handshake or sign or something along those lines, having in some way led the other to believe one is a school in such matters. Rote's heard sordidly that Freemasons are known to shag a sheep or two from the comical chef. He's a real Scotsman who has a mouth on him. So sordid and spoken so strongly in the Scottish accent that Rote's often left in stitches. Rote stares at the barman. He's been sitting there for some time now. He's wondering when the barman will get around to pulling another pint. It's been empty for as long as he can remember. And no one else is in the pub but him. Just him. Other times he's joined by one, two, or the entire crew, including his roommate. They sit barside, emptying pints, chatting about this and that. One time the cook comes in, clouded as he is, usually is, bothered by who knows what. He's from South Africa. He works alongside the chef in the inn's kitchen. So does one of the sons of the family run in. That night, 
Bert finds out for himself in a frank conversation with the Africaner. It seems as if the fellow, having had a relationship with the boss's daughter, still early in her teens, is left wanting and weighing on the inn's environment, especially the owner's daughter. Presumably, presumably he's well liked by the family run in, or he would be gone for this work. The distraught fellow knows he can't stay feeling the way he does, constantly reminded, reminded of his Lolita. So he buys in advance a one-way plane ticket back to South Africa after spending two years working at the inn. When he comes in the inn that night and sits barside at the pub, these things are revealed. And after a few more pints, he begins to share some terrible war stories. As an enlisted Afrikaner soldier for the South African army, he fights for love and colonized country. Immersed in the yields of one of South Africans' neighboring wars, this fellow finds himself on the front lines. He's forced to fire his rifle unwittingly. He kills a young girl, his bloody blown off face forever impoverished, and haunts him daytime, nighttime, dream time. The candid conversation reminds Rote of a similar scenes he's seen in movies, read in books, or retrieved from the dark recesses of his mind's realm of recollections. He recalls a time meeting a Micmac medicine man who also is haunted by his tour of duty. His is in Vietnam. This vet is visited and revisited by the visage of a young girl's blown off bloody face. He kills her at point blank rage. range. The way the medicine man relays his hurt that day of long ago at a gathering of the tribes under the umbrella of an arbor really hit Rose's heart. He feels the fellow's wavered wave of crestfallen emotion. Not so when he hears a South African similar story. He feels nothing. Probably being South stops him from feeling anything. But it doesn't stop Rope from remembering similar scenes seen and depicted often in many revisited Vietnam war movies. It makes Rope wonder about a book. The Five People You Meet in Heaven by Mitch Alba. There, the main character in the movie version is played by Angelina Jolie's father, John Voigt. He's visited by a Vietnamese girl he kills during the Vietnam War. Rope reflects on what he hears and remembers. The conversation goes in a different direction. The Afrikaner proceeds to parlay his unfortunate impulses to kill all the wildcats coming by the inn during his two-year stay. He shot at least 50 of them while sitting outside in an ambush behind the kitchen. Rook's taken many a late-night walk up and down the craggy port and has come upon the so-called wild cat doubling as a domesticated black cat. He begins to think this Afrikaner has suffered from post-war syndrome, believing in some misplaced manner that the black cats represent the Africans he's fought and killed. And adding to his dark deliverance, the Afrikaner often says the two races, sh races should never mix. That's his sticking point. And even after everyone in the inn, in their own way, tried to tease him somewhat on his statements, he remains stuck in them. Now, having already bought his one-way ticket, returned to South Africa, a country no longer run by Africans, but by Africans, Rote wonders how far and well he will fare. Onwards and away from the nether's anthem, Rote knows one thing. He really likes all the people there at the end, from the owners and their beautiful brood of children to the clientele and staff, including his estranged roommate and the anguished Afrikaner in magnanimity. The inn itself is a wonderful display of workmanship and the hearth of the inn being the stone, the stone fireplace. It serves as a magnet, magnetizing the more often than not dripping wet wanderer. The only estrangement felt is from his roommate, the one and only unhappy hindrance he has the whole time so far in his stay. The sordid situation has him more often than not stepping out or away from further discourse due to the disdain and that usually develops between the two. In lieu, he willingly escapes the blues by soldiering to Sterling on a wet and windy morning. Aye, a, a fine plan.